Chapter 11 Making a Night of It Damon and Pythias were undoubtedly very good fellows in their way. The former for his extreme readiness to put in special bail for a friend, and the latter for a certain Trump-like punctuality in turning up just in the very nick of time, scarcely less remarkable. Many points in their character have, however, grown obsolete. Daemons are rather hard to find in these days of imprisonment for debt, except the sham ones, and they cost half a crown. And, as to the Pythiases, the few that have existed in these degenerate times have had an unfortunate knack of making themselves scarce at the very moment when their appearance would have been strictly classical. If the actions of these heroes, however, can find no parallel in modern times, their friendship can. We have Damon and Pythias on the one hand, we have Potter and Smithers on the other. And, lest the two last-mentioned names should never have reached the ears of our unenlightened readers, we can do no better than make them acquainted with the owners thereof. Mr. Thomas Potter, then, was a clerk in the city, and Mr. Robert Smithers was a ditto in the same. Their incomes were limited, but their friendship was unbounded. They lived in the same street, walked into town every morning at the same hour, dined at the same slap bang every day, and reveled in each other's company every night. They were knit together by the closest ties of intimacy and friendship, or, as Mr. Thomas Potter touchingly observed, they were thick and thin pals and nothing but it. There was a spice of romance in Mr. Smithers' disposition, a ray of poetry, a gleam of misery, a sort of consciousness of he didn't exactly know what, coming across him he didn't precisely know why, which stood out in fine relief against the offhand, dashing, amateur pickpocket sort of manner, which distinguished Mr. Potter in an eminent degree. The peculiarity of their respective dispositions extended itself to their individual costume. Mr. Smithers generally appeared in public in a surtout and shoes, with a narrow black neckerchief and a brown hat, very much turned up at the sides, peculiarities which Mr. Potter wholly eschewed, for it was his ambition to do something in the celebrated kitty or stagecoach way, and he had even gone so far as to invest capital in the purchase of a rough blue coat with wooden buttons, made upon the fireman's principle, in which, with the addition of a low-crowned flower-pot saucer-shaped hat, he had created no inconsiderable sensation at the Albion and Little Russell Street and the diverse other places of public and fashionable resort. Mr. Potter and Mr. Smithers had mutually agreed that, on the receipt of their quarter's salary, they would jointly and in company spend the evening, an evident misnomer, the spending applying, as everybody knows, not to the evening itself, but to all the money the individual may chance to be possessed of, on the occasion to which reference is made. And they had likewise agreed that, on the evening aforesaid, they would make a night of it. An expressive term, implying the borrowing of several hours from tomorrow morning, adding them to the night before, and manufacturing a compound night of the whole. The quarter day arrived at last. We say at last, because quarter days are as eccentric as comets moving wonderfully quick when you have a good deal to pay, and marvelously slow when you have a little to receive. Mr. Thomas Potter and Mr. Robert Smithers met by appointment to begin the evening with a dinner, and a nice, snug, comfortable dinner they had, consisting of a little procession of four chops and four kidneys, following each other, supported on either side by a pot of the real drought stout, and attended by diverse cushions of bread and wedges of cheese. When the cloth was removed, Mr. Thomas Potter ordered the waiter to bring in two goes of his best Scotch whiskey, with warm water and sugar, and a couple of his very mildest Havanas, which the waiter did. Mr. Thomas Potter mixed his grog and lighted his cigar. Mr. Robert Smithers did the same. And then, Mr. Thomas Potter jocularly proposed as the first toast, the abolition of all offices whatever, not sinecures but counting houses, which was immediately drunk by Mr. Robert Smithers with enthusiastic applause. So they went on, 
talking politics, puffing cigars, and sipping whiskey and water until the goes, most appropriately so called, were both gone, which Mr. Robert Smithers perceiving, immediately ordered in two more goes of the best Scotch whiskey and two more of the very mildest Havanas. And the goes kept coming in, and the mild Havanas kept going out, until what with the drinking, and lighting, and puffing, and the stale ashes on the table, and the tallow grease on the cigars, Mr. Robert Smithers began to doubt the mildness of the Havanas, and to feel very much as if he had been sitting in a hackney coach with his back to the horses. As to Mr. Thomas Potter, he would keep laughing out loud, and volunteering in articulate declarations that he was all right, in proof of which he feebly bespoke the evening paper after the next gentleman, but finding it a matter of some difficulty to discover any news in its columns, or to ascertain distinctly whether it had any columns at all, walked slowly out to look for the moon, and, after coming back quite pale with looking up at the sky so long, and attempting to express mirth at Mr. Robert Smithers having fallen asleep by various galvanic chuckles, laid his head on his arm, and went to sleep also. When he awoke again, Mr. Robert Smithers awoke too, and they both very gravely agreed that it was extremely unwise to eat so many pickled walnuts with the chops, as it was a notorious fact that they always made people queer and sleepy. Indeed, if it had not been for the whiskey and cigars, there was no knowing what harm they mightn't have done him. So they took some coffee, and after paying the bill, twelve and tuppence for the dinner, and the odd tenpence for the waiter, thirteen shillings in all, started out on their expedition to manufacture a knight. It was just half past eight, so they thought they couldn't do better than go at half price to the slips at the city theatre, which they did accordingly. Mr. Robert Smithers, who had become extremely poetical after the settlement of the bill, enlivening the walk by informing Mr. Thomas Potter in confidence that he felt an inward presentment of approaching dissolution, and subsequently embellishing the theater by falling asleep with his head and both arms gracefully drooping over the front of the boxes. Such was the quiet demeanor of the unassuming Smithers, and such were the happy effects of Scotch whiskey and Havanas on that interesting person. But Mr. Thomas Potter, whose great aim it was to be considered as a knowing card, a fast goer, and so forth, conducted himself in a very different manner, and commenced going very fast indeed, rather too fast at last, for the patience of the audience to keep pace with him. On his first entry, he contented himself by earnestly calling upon the gentleman in the gallery to flare up, accompanying the demand with another request, expressive of his wish that they would instantaneously form a union, both which requisitions were responded to in the manner most in vogue on such occasions. "'Give that dog a bone!' cried one gentleman in his shirt sleeves. "'Where have you been a-having half a pint of intermediate beer?' cried a second. "'Taylor!' screamed a third. "'Bachelor's clerk!' shouted a fourth. "'Throw him over!' roared a fifth. While numerous voices concurred in desiring Mr. Thomas Porter to go home to his mother, all these taunts Mr. Thomas Potter received with supreme contempt, cocking the low crown hat a little more on one side whenever any reference was made to his personal appearance, and, standing up with his arms akimbo, expressing defiance melodramatically. The overture, to which these various sounds had been an ad libitum accompaniment, concluded. The second piece began and Mr. Thomas Potter, emboldened by impunity, proceeded to behave in a most unprecedented and outrageous manner. First of all, he imitated the shake of the principal female singer, then groaned at the blue fire, then affected to be frightened into convulsions of terror at the appearance of the ghost, and, lastly, not only made a running commentary in an audible voice upon the dialogue on the stage, but actually awoke Mr. Robert Smithers, who, hearing his companion making a noise, and having a very indistinct notion where he was, or what was required of him, immediately, by way of imitating a good example, set up the most unearthly, unremitting, and appalling howling that ever audience heard. It was too much. Turn them out! was the general cry. 
a noise as of shuffling of feet, and men being knocked up with violence against wainscoting was heard. A hurried dialogue of, Come out! I won't! You shall! I shan't! Give me your card, sir! You're a scoundrel, sir! And so forth succeeded. A round of applause betokened the approbation of the audience, and Mr. Robert Smithers and Mr. Thomas Potter found themselves shot with astonishing swiftness into the road, without having had the trouble of once putting foot to ground during the whole progress of their rapid descent. Mr. Robert Smithers, being constitutionally one of the slow-goers, and having had quite enough of fast-going in the course of his recent expulsion to last until the quarter day then next ensuing at the very least, had no sooner emerged with his companion from the precincts of Milton Street than he proceeded to indulge in circuitous references to the beauties of sleep, mingled with distant allusions to the propriety of returning to Islington and testing the influence of their patent brahmas over the street door locks to which they respectively belonged. Mr. Thomas Potter, however, was valorous and peremptory. They had come out to make a night of it, and a night must be made. So Mr. Robert Smithers, who was three parts dull and the other dismal, despairingly assented, and they went into a wine vault to get materials for assisting them in making a night, where they found a good many young ladies and various old gentlemen, and a plentiful sprinkling of hackney coachmen and cab drivers, all drinking and talking together. And Mr. Thomas Potter and Mr. Robert Smithers drank small glasses of brandy and large glasses of soda, until they began to have a very confused idea, either of things in general or of anything in particular. And, when they had done treating themselves, they began to treat everybody else. And the rest of the entertainment was a confused mixture of heads and heels, black eyes and blue uniforms, mud and gaslights, thick doors, and stone paving. Then, as standard novelists expressively inform us, all was a blank. And in the morning, the blank was filled up with the words, Station House. And the Station House was filled up with Mr. Thomas Potter, Mr. Robert Smithers, and the major part of their wine vault companions of the preceding night, with a comparatively small portion of clothing of any kind. And it was disclosed at the police office, to the indignation of the bench and the astonishment of the spectators, how one Robert Smithers aided and abetted by one Thomas Potter, had knocked down and beaten in diverse streets at different times five men, four boys, and three women. How the said Thomas Potter had feloniously obtained possession of five door knockers, two bell handles, and a bonnet. How Mr. Robert Smithers, his friend, had sworn at least forty pounds worth of oaths at the rate of five shillings apiece terrified whole streets full of Her Majesty's subjects with awful shrieks and alarms of fire, destroyed the uniforms of five policemen, and committed various other atrocities too numerous to recapitulate. And the magistrate, after an appropriate reprimand, fined Mr. Thomas Potter and Mr. Thomas Smithers five shillings each for being, what the law vulgarly terms, drunk, and thirty-four pounds for seventeen assaults at forty shillings a head, with liberty to speak to the prosecutors. The prosecutors were spoken to, and Messrs. Potters and Smithers lived on credit for a quarter as best they might, and, although the prosecutors expressed their readiness to be assaulted twice a week on the same terms, they have never since been detected in making a night of it. Chapter 12 The Prisoner's Van We were passing the corner of Bow Street, on our return from a lounging excursion the other afternoon, when a crowd, assembled round the door of the police office, attracted our attention. We turned up the street accordingly. There were thirty or forty people, standing on the pavement and half across the road, and a few stragglers were patiently stationed on the opposite side of the way, all evidently waiting in expectation of some arrival. We waited, too, a few minutes, but nothing occurred. So, we turned round to an unshorn, sallow-looking cobbler, who was standing next to us with his hands under the bib of his apron, and put the usual question of, What's the matter? The cobbler eyed us from head to foot with superlative contempt, and laconically replied, Neffin. 
Now, we were perfectly aware that if two men stop in the street to look at any given object, or even to gaze in the air, 200 men will be assembled in no time. But, as we knew very well that no crowd of people could by possibility remain in the street for five minutes without getting up a little amusement among themselves, unless they had some absorbing object in view, the natural inquiry next in order was, What are all these people waiting here for? A majesty's carriage, replied the cobbler. This was still more extraordinary. We could not imagine what earthly business Her Majesty's carriage could have at the public office Bow Street. We were beginning to ruminate on the possible causes of such an uncommon appearance when a general exclamation from the boys in the crowd of, Here's the wan! caused us to raise our heads and look up the street. The covered vehicle in which prisoners are conveyed from the police offices to the different prisons was coming along at full speed. It then occurred to us, for the first time, that Her Majesty's carriage was merely another name for the prisoner's van, conferred upon it not only by reason of the superior gentility of the term, but because the aforesaid van is maintained at Her Majesty's expense, having been originally started for the exclusive accommodation of ladies and gentlemen under the necessity of visiting the various houses of call known by the general denomination of Her Majesty's jails. The van drew up at the office door, and the people thronged round the steps, just leaving a little alley for the prisoners to pass through. Our friend the cobbler and the other stragglers crossed over, and we followed their example. The driver and another man, who had been seated by his side in front of the vehicle, dismounted, and were admitted into the office. The office door was closed after them, and the crowd were on the tiptoe of expectation. After a few minutes' delay, the door again opened, and the two first prisoners appeared. They were a couple of girls, of whom the elder could not be more than sixteen, and the younger of whom had certainly not attained her fourteenth year. That they were sisters was evident from the resemblance which still subsisted between them, though two additional years of depravity had fixed their brand upon the elder girl's features, as legibly as if a red-hot iron had seared them. They were both gaudily dressed, the younger one especially, and, although there was a strong similarity between them in both respects, which was rendered the more obvious by their being handcuffed together, it is impossible to conceive a greater contrast than the demeanor of the two presented. The younger girl was weeping bitterly, not for display or in the hope of producing effect, but for very shame. Her face was buried in her handkerchief, and her whole manner was but too expressive of bitter and unavailing sorrow. "'How long are you for, Emily?' screamed a red-faced woman in the crowd. Six weeks in labor,' replied the elder girl with a flaunting laugh. "'And that's better than the stone jug, anyhow. "'The mill's a deal better than the sessions, "'and here's Bella a-going to for the first time. "'Hold up your head, you chicken,' she continued, "'boisterously tearing the other girl's handkerchief away. "'Hold up your head and show me your face. "'I ain't jealous, but I'm blessed if I ain't game.' "'That's right, old gal,' exclaimed a man in a paper cap, "'who, in common with the greater part of the crowd, had been expressibly delighted with this little incident. Right, replied the girl. Ah, to be sure. What's the odds, eh? Come, in with you, interrupted the driver. Don't you be in a hurry, coachman, replied the girl. And recollect I want to be set down in cold bath fields. Large house with a high garden wall in front. You can't mistake it. Hello. Bella, where are you going to? You'll pull my precious arm off. This was addressed to the younger girl, who, in her anxiety to hide herself in the caravan, had ascended the steps first, and forgotten the strain upon the handcuff. Come down, and let's show you the way. After jerking the miserable girl down with a force which made her stagger on the pavement, she got into the vehicle, and was followed by her wretched companion. These two girls had been thrown upon London streets, their vices and debauchery, by a sordid and rapacious mother. What the younger girl was then, the elder had once been. And what the elder then was the younger must soon become. A melancholy prospect, but how surely to be realized. A tragic drama, but how often acted. Turn to the prisons and police offices of London. Nay, look into the very streets themselves. These things pass before our eyes, day after day and hour after hour. They have become such matters, of course, that they are utterly disregarded. 
The progress of these girls in crime will be as rapid as the flight of a pestilence, resembling it too in its baneful influence and widespreading infection. Step by step, how many wretched females within the sphere of every man's observation have become involved in a career of vice frightful to contemplate, hopeless at its commencement, loathsome and repulsive in its course, friendless, forlorn, and unpitied at its miserable conclusion. There were other prisoners, boys of ten, as hardened in vice as men of fifty. A houseless vagrant going joyfully to prison as a place of food and shelter, handcuffed to a man whose prospects were ruined, character lost, and family rendered destitute by his first offense. Our curiosity, however, was satisfied. The first group had left an impression on our mind we would gladly have avoided, and would willingly have effaced. The crowd dispersed, the vehicle rolled away with its load of guilt and misfortune, and we saw no more of the prisoner's van.